Hi, good day. On this module, module 11, we will be talking about network design. Okay, so the module title is network design. And at the end of this video lecture, you should be able to explain the characteristics of scalable network architectures. Also part of this video lecture are the hierarchical networks, scalable networks, switch hardware, and router hardware. Let's start. Okay, so hierarchical networks, implementing a network design. So effective network implementation requires a solid understanding of the current state of recommended network models and their ability to scale as the network grows. In hierarchical network design, okay, so the hierarchical network model and the Cisco enterprise architectures are models to consider when designing a network. So this section reviews the importance of scalability and how these models can effectively address that need. So the need to scale the network so business increasingly rely on their network infrastructure to provide emission critical services. Okay, so as the business grow and evolve, they hire more employees, open branch offices, and expand into global markets. So these changes directly affect the requirements of a network. So a large business environment with many users, locations, and systems is referred to as the enterprise network. Okay, so the network that is used to support the business enterprise is called an enterprise network. All right, so an enterprise network must support the exchange of various types of network traffic, including data files, email, IP telephony, and video applications for multiple business units. So all enterprise networks must support critical applications, okay? Uh, support converged network traffic. It must support diverse business needs and it provides a centralized administrative control, okay? So a campus network design includes small networks that use a single LAN switch up to a very large networks with thousands of connections. We call it enterprise network. Okay, so next on the hierarchical networks is a borderless switched network. So with the increasing demands of a converged network, the network must be developed with an architectural approach that embeds intelligence, simplifies operations, and is scalable to meet future demands. So one of the more recent developments in network design is the Cisco borderless networks architecture as illustrated here okay so the cisco borderless network is a network architecture that combines several innovations and design considerations to allow organizations to connect anyone anywhere anytime and on any device securely reliably and seamlessly this architecture is designed to address it and business challenges such as supporting the converged network and changing the work patterns. So the Cisco borderless network is built on an infrastructure of scalable and resilient hardware and software. It enables different elements from access switch to wireless access points to work together and allow users to access resources from any place at any time providing optimization, scalability, and security to collaborate or to collaboration and virtualization. Okay, so a borderless switch network are said to be hierarchical, modular, resilient, and flexible. Okay, so um, creating a borderless uh, switch network requires that sound network design principles that are used to ensure maximum availability, flexibility, security, and manageability. 
The borderless switch network must deliver on current requirements and future required services and technologies. The borderless switch network design guidelines are built on the following principles as mentioned earlier. You've got the hierarchical, the modularity, the resiliency, and the flexibility. So what are those terms? When you say hierarchical, it facilitates understanding the role of each device at every tier, simplifies development and deployment, operations, and management, as well as reducing the fault domains at every tier. When you say modularity, it allows seamless network expansion and integrated service enablement and on-demand basis. So when you say modularity, you could easily expand the network, okay, so without affecting the rest of the network, okay? So next is resiliency. It satisfies user expectations for keeping the network always on, okay? And flexibility, which allows intelligent traffic load sharing by using a small network resources. These are not independent principles, okay? So understanding how each principle fits in the context of other is critical. Designing a borderless switch network in a hierarchical fashion creates a foundation that allows network designers to overlay security, mobility, and unified communication features. So two time-tested and proven hierarchical network frameworks for campus networks are this uh, three-tier layer and the two-tier layer models, okay? So when you say three-tier, you've got the presence of the core, the distribution, and the access layers. When you say two-tier, okay, we combined the core and the distribution layer, and of course, you'll have the access layers, okay? Now, when you say access layer, the access layer provides network access to the user, okay? It represents the network edge. This is where traffic enters or exits the campus network. So traditionally, the primary function of an access layer is to provide a network access to the users. Access layer switches connect to distribution layer switches, which implement network foundation technologies such as routing, quality of service, and security. So to meet the network application and the end user demand, the next generation switching platforms now provide more converged, integrated, and intelligent switches, okay? And services to various types of endpoints at the network edge. So building intelligence into access layer switches allows applications to operate on the network more efficiently and securely. So basically, when you say access layer, that is where the users are situated. That is where the user resides. Okay, so the next one is a distribution layer. The distribution layer interfaces between the access layer and the core layer to provide many important functions, including aggregating the large-scale wiring closet networks, aggregating layer two broadcast domains and layer two routing boundaries, providing intelligent switching, routing, and network access policy functions to access the rest of the network. So providing high availability through redundant distribution layer switches to the end user and equal cost path to the core, okay? So providing differentiated services to various classes of service applications at the edge of the network. So that's distribution layer. So the last one is a core layer. The core layer is the network backbone. It connects several layers of the campus network. The core layer serves as the aggregator for all the other campus blocks and ties the campus together with the rest of the network. So the primary purpose of the core layer is to provide fault isolation and high-speed backbone connectivity. Okay? All right. So let us differentiate a three-tier and a two-tier campus network. Okay. So in a three-tier campus network design for organizations, 
where the access, distribution, and core are its separate layers. So to build a simplified, scalable, cost-effective, and efficient physical cable layout design, the recommendation is to build an extended star physical network topology from a centralized building location to all the other buildings on the campus as shown in this diagram here. Okay? Now, in some cases, because of the lack of physical or network scalability restrictions, maintaining a separate distribution and core layer is not required. So in smaller campus locations where there are fewer users accessing the network or in campus sites consisting of a single building, separate core and distribution layers may not be needed. So in this scenario, the recommendation is the alternate two-tier campus network design as shown on this diagram, wherein we have the collapsed distribution and core combined, okay? And of course, you've got the access layers there, okay? Next, let's talk about the role of a switch network, okay? Now, what is a switch network? A switch networks are important when deploying wired LANs. A network professional today must be well-versed on switches and LAN technology in order to add commonly deployed devices such as PCs, printers, video cameras, phones, copiers, and scanners. So sharing and accessing network devices is common in both the home and the business network. Now, what is the role of a switch network? Okay. The role of a switch network has evolved dramatically in the last two decades. Okay, so it was not long ago that a flat layer two switch network were the form. Okay, flat layer two data networks relied on the basic properties of Ethernet and the widespread use of hubs repeaters to propagate land traffic throughout the organization. Okay. So, networks have fundamentally changed to switch LANs in a hierarchical network. A switch LAN allows more flexibility, traffic management, and additional features such as the quality of service, additional security, uh, traffic management, okay, support the wireless networking and connectivity, and support for new technologies such as IP telephony and mobility services. Okay. Next is scalable networks. Okay, in network design, so next is the scalable networks, extending the network. A solid network design is not all that is needed for network expansion. So this section reviews the features necessary to ensure that the network scales well as the company grows. Okay. So the design for scalability, scalability is the term for network that can grow without losing availability and reliability. Okay, network designers must develop strategies to enable the network to be available and to scale effectively and easily. So this is accomplished using these four components here, which includes redundancy, multiple links, scalability or scalable routing protocol and wireless connectivity. Now let's start with redundancy. So planning for redundancy is a critical design feature for many company networks. Okay, so implementing redundancy for many organizations, the availability of the network is essential to support business needs. Redundancy is an important part of network design for preventing disruption of network services by minimizing the possibility of a single point of failure. So one method of implementing redundancy is by adding duplicate equipment and providing failover services for critical devices. So as shown here on the diagram, so we have a backup path or redundancy path okay, to connect the wiring closet with a backbone and to the server farm. Okay. So another method of implementing redundancy is using redundant paths as shown in the diagram here. Redundant paths offer alternate physical paths for data to traverse the network. 
Redundant path is a switch network support high availability. However, because of the operations of the switches, this redundant path in a switch Ethernet network can cause a layer to logical loops. Right? So for this reason, the spanning tree protocol or STP is required. Okay. So a well-designed network not only controls traffic but also limits the size of failure domain okay a failure domain is the area of the network that is impacted when critical device or network service experiences problems the function of the device that initially fails determines the impact of a failure domain so for example a malfunctioning switch on a network segment normally affects only the hosts on that segment so however if the router that connects this segment to others fails, the impact is much greater. So the use of redundant links and reliable enterprise class equipment minimizes the chance of disruption in the network. So smaller failure domains reduce the impact of a failure on a company productivity. They also simplify the troubleshooting process, thereby shortening the downtime for all the users. So failure domains often include other smaller failure domains. Okay? So what we can do is we have to limit the size of failure domains. So because a failure domain at the core layer of a network can have potentially large impact. The network designer often concentrates on efforts to prevent failures. So these efforts can greatly increase the cost of implementing the network. In the hierarchical design model, it is easiest and usually least expensive to control the size of the failure domain in the distribution layer. So in the distribution layer, the network errors can be contained to a smaller area, thus affecting fewer users. So when using a layer 3 devices at the distribution layer, every router functions as a gateway for a limited number of access layer users. Okay. okay, so another component is to increase the bandwidth. Okay, increasing the bandwidth. Okay, so bandwidth demand continues to grow as users increasingly access video content and migrate to IP phones. So either channel can quickly add more bandwidth. Okay, so to get the increase in bandwidth, we have to do some sort of link aggregations. Okay, and in link aggregation, we are using the technology called Ether Channel here. Now, in the hierarchical network design, some links between the access and the distribution switches might need to process a greater amount of traffic than other links. So as traffic from multiple links converges into a single outgoing link, it is possible for that link to become a bottleneck. So link aggregation allows an administrator to increase the amount of bandwidth between devices by creating a logical link made up of several physical links as shown in the diagram here okay so these devices are connected physically by two physical links but virtually this is considered to be a single virtual link called ether channel okay now ether channel uses the existing switch ports therefore additional costs to upgrade the link to a faster and more expensive connection are not necessary. The Ethernet channel or the Ether channel is seen as one logical link using the Ether channel interface. So most configuration tasks are done on the Ether channel interface so instead of on each of the individual port, ensuring configuration consistencies throughout the links. Finally, the Ether channel configuration takes advantage of load balancing between the links that are part of the same Ether channel, okay? And depending on the hardware platform or more load balancing methods can be impacted. So there are two common Ether channel protocol being used, which are the LACP and the PHGP, all right? Okay, so next is expanding the access layer. So except in the most secure setting, today's users expect wireless access to the networks. So implementing a wireless connectivity 
the network must be designed to be able to expand network access to individuals and devices as needed. So, an increasingly important aspect of extending the access layer connectivity is through wireless connectivity. So, providing wireless connectivity with many advantages. Okay, so like increased flexibility, reduced costs, and the ability to grow and adapt to changing network and business requirements. So, to communicate wirelessly, and devices requires a wireless NIC or the network interface card that incorporates a radio transmitter or receiver and the required software driver to make it operational. All right. So additionally, a wireless router or a wireless access point or AP is required for users to connect as shown on this diagram here. So there are many considerations when implementing a wireless network, such as the types of network devices to use, the wireless coverage requirements, the interference considerations, and security considerations. All right. Okay, so next is tune routing protocols. So fine-tuning a routing protocol. Okay, so routing protocol configuration is usually rather straightforward. However, to take a full advantage of the protocol's feature set, it is often necessary to modify the configuration. Okay, so managing the routed network, for instance, enterprise network and ISPs often more advanced protocol. Okay. It uses more advanced protocols such as the link state protocols because of their hierarchical that design and ability to scale for large networks. So in such, link state routing protocol like the OSPF work well for larger hierarchical networks where fast convergence is important. So OSPF routers establishes and maintain neighbor adjacency or adjacencies with other connected OSPF routers. So when routers initiate an adjacency with neighbors, an exchange of full link updates begins. Okay, so routers reach a full state of adjacency when they have synchronized views on their link state databases. So with OSPF, link state updates are sent when the network changes occur. So OSPF is a popular link state routing protocol that can be fine-tuned in many ways. Now, as shown here in the diagram, okay, so the network has been divided into a multi-area or different areas. Okay, so that is to shorten or to, to change the size, okay, or to change the broadcast domains into smaller sizes using different areas. So for instance, in here, this group of routers here are grouped into area one, okay? The routers on the right are in area 51. So the consideration for fine tuning is we have to use a multi-area OSPF principles wherein all the non-area zero, okay? Like area one and area 51 should be connected to the backbone called area zero, all right? Okay, so let's talk about the switch hardware now. So selecting network devices, a basic understanding of switch and router hardware is essential to implementing network designs that scale. All right, so the switch hardware, the Cisco switches address the needs at the access, distribution, and core layers. Many models scale well with the network as it grows. Okay, so there's a uh, section covers on selecting the switch hardware. Okay, let's start with the switch platforms. So when designing a network, it is important to select the proper hardware to meet the current network requirements, as well as to allow the network growth. Okay, so within an enterprise network, both switches and routers play a critical role in network communication. So there are five categories of switches for the enterprise networks. Okay. So one is the campus LAN switches, cloud managed switches, data center switches, service provider switches, and the virtual networking switches. Okay. 
So the campus LAN switches such as this Cisco 3850 series support high concentrations of user connections with speed and security appropriate for the enterprise network. So to scale network performance in an enterprise LAN, there are core distribution and access and compact switches. So this switch platforms vary from fanless switches with 8 fixed ports to 13 blade switches supporting hundreds of ports. Okay, so campus LAN switches platforms include the 2960, the 3560, 3750, 3850, 4500, 6500, and 6800 series. Okay, so these are the lineup for the campus LAN switches. Okay, so how about the cloud managed switches? Okay, so the Cisco Meraki cloud managed access switches enable virtual stacking of switches. They monitor and configure thousands of switch ports over the web without intervention of the on-site IP staff. Okay, so that's the good thing about this. Now, the Cisco Nexus platform promotes infrastructure, scalability, operational continuity, and transport flexibility in the data center. Right? So the next one are data center switches. Okay? So for the data center switches, it should be built on switches that promote infrastructure scalability, operational continuity, and transport flexibility. So the data center switch platforms include the Cisco Nexus, okay, series switches, and the Cisco Catalyst 6500 series switches. All right. You also have the service provider switches. Okay. So service provider switches fall under two categories, aggregation switches and the Ethernet access switches. So aggregation switches are a carrier grade Ethernet switches that aggregate traffic at the edge of the network. Whereas the service provider Ethernet access switches feature application intelligence, unified services, virtualization, integrated security, and simplified management. All right. Okay, so we also have what you call the virtual networking switches. Now, networks are becoming increasingly virtualized. So the Cisco Nexus virtual networking switch platforms provide a secure multi-tenant services by adding virtualization intelligence technology to the data center network. Okay, so special cables also are used for some of the switches like the static cable switches that allow them to effectively operate as one large switch. Okay, so the thickness of the switch, which is expressed in the number of rack units, okay, is also an important for switches that are mounted on a rack. Okay, so as shown in the diagram here. All right. Okay, so next, what are the other considerations on selecting a switch? So you also have to consider port density. Okay, the port density of a switch refers to the number of ports available on a single switch. Okay, so the port density pertains to the number of ports available on the switch. So that would depend on the model of the switch. Okay, so there are some switches that comes with 8, okay, 12, 24, port 8 or even higher port configurations. So when selecting a switch, a network administrator must determine the switch form factors. This includes a fixed configuration, okay, as shown here on the diagram, okay, that is a Cisco Catalyst 3850. You also have a modular configuration, okay, as shown on the right side, okay, and not shown here are stackable configuration or the non-stackable configuration, okay. So for the fixed configuration switches, typically it supports up to 48 ports, okay, port configurations on a single device. So they have options for up to four additional ports for a small form factor, okay, or we call it the, the four small form factor pluggable or the SFP devices. So high port densities allows for better use of limited space and power, okay. 
So if there are two switches that each contain 24 ports, they would be able to support up to 46 devices because at least two, one of the port per switch is lost with the connection to each other. All right. So modular switches can support a very high port densities through the addition of a multiple switch port line cards. For example, some Catalyst 6500 switches can support in excess of 1000 switch ports. Can you imagine that? 1000 switch ports that can connect possibly around 1000 workstations also. All right. So large enterprise networks that support many thousands of network devices requires high density modular switches to make um, the number of devices that can be need a network access. So this approach can consume many power outlets and a lot of closet spaces. Okay, so that is why the designer or the network designer must also consider the issue of uplink bottlenecks. A series of fixed configuration switches can consume many additional ports for bandwidth aggregation between switches. For the purpose of achieving the target performance, with a single modular switch, bandwidth aggregation is less of an issue because the backplane of the chassis can provide a necessary bandwidth to accommodate the necessary or to accommodate the devices connected to the switch port line cards. All right? So aside from port density, another consideration is the forwarding rates. Okay? So forwarding rates define processing capabilities of a switch by rating how much data the switch can process per second. Okay? So switch product lines are classified by forwarding rates. So we have some sort of the entry level switches have a lower forwarding rate than the enterprise level switches. So forwarding rates are important to consider when selecting a switch. So if the switch forwarding rate is too low, it cannot accommodate a full wire speed communication across all of its switch ports. So wire speed is the data rate that an Ethernet port on the switch is capable of attaining. So their data range can be 100 Mbps, 1 Gbps, 10 Gbps, or even 100 Gbps, right? So for example, a typical 48 port gigabit switch operating at a full wire speed generates a 48 gigabit per second of traffic. So if the switch only supports a forwarding rate of 32 Gbps, it cannot run at a full wire speed across all ports simultaneously. So fortunately, Access layer switches typically do not need to operate at a full wire speed. Okay, so because they are physically limited by their uplinks to the distribution layer. So this means that less expensive, lower performing switches can be used at the access layer. And more expensive, higher performing switches can be used at the distribution layer and core layers. Okay, where the forwarding rate has a greater impact on the network performance. Okay, another feature is the PoE or the power over Ethernet. So PoE allows the switch to deliver power to a device over the existing Ethernet cabling. So this feature can be used by IP phones and some wireless access points. So PoE allows more flexibility when installing wireless access points and IP phones allowing them to be installed anywhere that there is an Ethernet cable. A network administrator should ensure that the PoE features are required because switches that support PoE are expensive. Okay, so you have to think twice, all right? You have to think carefully about looking for the PoE feature on a switch. So when there is a need, then go ahead and get it. Okay, next is a multi-layer switching. So when you say multi-layer switches, these are typically deployed in the core and distribution layers of an organization's switch network. A multi-layer switches are characterized by their ability to build a routing table, supports a few routing protocols, and forward IP packets at the rate close to that of a layer two forwarding devices. So multi-layer switch is also called as a switch with routing capability. All right. So a multi-layer switch often support specialized hardware such as the application-specific integrated circuits or the ASIC. 
So ASIC, along with a dedicated software, data structures, can streamline the forwarding of IP packets independent of the CPU. Okay? So again, a multi-layer switch like 3560, okay? These are used if you want to have routing protocols running on your switch. So this is a layer 3 switch, okay? So a device that is capable of doing routing and switching at the same time. Okay, so next is the business considerations for switch selection. So the following list highlights the common business considerations when selecting a switch equipment. So of course, the company has to look for the cost, all right? So the cost of a switch will depend on the number and speed of interfaces supported features and expansion capability. You also have the port density, which pertains to the network switches must support the appropriate number of devices in the network. You also have power. It is now common to power access points, IP phones, and even compact switches using the PoE. So in addition to PoE considerations, some chassis-based switches support redundant power supplies. You also have reliability. The switch should provide continuous access to the network. Port speed, the speed of the network connection, is of primary concern to end users. You also have the frame buffers, the ability of the switch to store frames. This is important in a network where there might be congestions no? or congested ports to servers or other areas on the network. And the last one is, of course, scalability. This pertains to the number of users of the network typically grows over time. All right, so therefore, the switch should provide the opportunity for growth. All right. Okay, so we're done with the switch. Let's talk about the hardware now on a router. So router hardware, like switches, routers can play a role in the access distribution and core layers of the network. So in many small networks like branch offices and a teleworker's home network, all three layers are implemented within a router. Okay. Now in the distribution layer of an enterprise network, routing is required. Without routing process, packets cannot leave the local area network. So routers play a critical role in networking by interconnecting multiple sites within an enterprise network. So providing redundant paths and connecting to ISPs on the internet. Routers can also act as a translator between different media types and protocols. For example, a router can accept packets from an Ethernet network and re-encapsulate them to transport over a serial network. So routers use a network portion of the destination IP address to route packets to a proper destination. So they select an alternate path if a link goes down or traffic is congested. So all ports on a local network specify the IP address of the local router interface in their destination or in their IP configuration. So this router interface is the default gateway. So routers also serve the following beneficial functions like providing a broadcast containment connect remote locations, group users logically by application or department, and provide enhanced security. So there is really a need for a router to be deployed on your organization. Okay. Now, as the network grows, it is important to select a proper router to meet its requirement. So these are the three categories of routers. So you've got the branch routers, the network edge routers, and the service provider routers. Now in here, I have here a branch routers, okay? So branch routers optimize branch services on a single platform while delivering an optimal application experience across a branch and one infrastructures. So maximizing service availability at the branch requires network design for 24 by seven by 365 uptime. So that means your network is running 365 days a year, okay? Without shutting it down. So high available branch networks must ensure fast recovery from typical faults while minimizing or eliminating the impact on service and provide simple network configuration and management. 
Okay? So an example of that includes the ISR 4000 series routers. Okay? So this one is a little bit expensive. All right? So next is a network edge routers. A network edge routers enables the network edge to deliver high performance, highly secure, and reliable services that unite campus, data center, and branch networks. So customers expect a high availability media experience and more types of content than ever before. Okay? So customers want interactivity, personalization, mobility, and control of all the content. So customers want to access content anytime and any place they choose over any device, whether at home or at work or on the go. So network edge routers must deliver enhanced quality of service and non-stop video and mobile capabilities. So an example of a network edge router is shown here as such as ASR or the Aggregation Services Routers 9000 series. Okay? And you also have the service provider routers. Okay? Service provider routers differentiate the service portfolio and increase revenues by delivering an end-to-end -end scalable solutions and subscribers aware services. Okay? So this includes the Cisco Network Convergence Systems or NCS 6000 series routers. All right? So operators must optimize operations reduce expenses, and improve scalability and flexibility to deliver the next generation internet experience across all the devices and locations. So these systems are designed to simplify and enhance the operation and deployment of a service delivery networks. All right? Okay, so we also have these industrial routers, okay, such as the ones shown in the diagram are designed to provide an enterprise class features in a rugged and harsh environment. Okay, shown here are the 1100 series industrial ISRs or integrated service routers. Okay, so there is a Cisco lineup of products for every company needs and situations. Okay, so aside from that, you also have the Cisco 9000 series. This is a small branch office router, it combines one switching security and advanced connectivity options in a compact uh, package. So fanless platform for small and medium sized businesses. You also have this ASR 9000 and 1000 series aggregation services routers. So these routers provide density and resiliency with programmability for a scalable network edge. Okay. Next is the Cisco Network Convergence, uh, Convergence Systems 5500 series routers. So these routers are designed to efficiently scale between large networks or large data centers and large enterprise networks, web and service provider one and aggregation networks. Okay, so when it comes to port density, you have a huge port density to this one. Okay. So also, they have the Cisco 800 Industrial Integrated Services Routers. So this router is compact and designed for harsh environments. So take a look at the packaging. All right. So it seems tough. Okay. So there is a lineup of different models. Okay. So this would depend on the organization's needs. Okay. So from Cisco. So Cisco offers all possible lineup of devices from routers to switches for the organizations depending on the need and sizes of the organization. All right. So that ends up our video lecture. So have a great day and thank you for watching and listening.